thank you very much for allowing me to join you tonight and uh, listening to Dr. Paul. Uh, by the way, I have great respect for his father and, and have uh, actually I'm a participant in the Liberty Caucus, which uh, he holds, and uh, have enjoyed the intellectual stimulation that's a part of that for a long, long time. Um, and and cer certainly the campaign, I think Dr. Paul's campaign deserves a lot of credit for its uh, enthusiasm and also it's great to be raising a lot of money. I remember not too long ago, right after uh, the reports came out, by the way, uh, in the first quarter and uh, uh, the late night comedian of sorts named uh, Conan O'Brien kept saying, he, he gave, went on and he said, uh, Giuliani raised $25 million, and uh, Obama raised $30 million, and Hillary raised $26 million, and Tancredo raised two children. <laughs> and, uh, and although it is, uh, it is certainly true that we raised, my wife and I have raised two children, and they are now raising our five grandchildren. Uh, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't trade that for anything in the whole world, as a matter of fact. Amen. reporting period, I'd actually raised more than anybody else on that second tier of candidates. <laughs> and the one thing about which I am most proud, I have to tell you, is that we have the highest percentage of contributors who fall into what's called the low donor category. 78% of the people who contributed to my campaign are in that category, low donor category, $200 or less. And I, you know what, it makes me feel, I don't know, great inside to know that that is the case. I am proud of it. And, uh, and, by the way, if there's folks in this room that have uh, contributed, and I want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, thank you very, very much. I sincerely appreciate it. The, not too long ago, I think it was two weeks ago, um, I read something that was really quite incredible, it seemed to me anyway, to be incredible. There was a debate going on at the UN, and it involved the discussion of uh, the whether or not, of course, there was a, first of all, global warming and what individual countries were going to do about it. And uh, there were attempts to get agreements on the part of several countries, and the United States included, to set caps on emissions, especially carbon emissions. Well, we've all heard about these things. This is not new. This debate is not new, and you may wonder how it has an effect on uh, its pertinence to this issue. Well, let me tell you, China at this particular function, in this particular debate, said that it wanted to have 1.5 billion tons of credit because of its carbon credits. Because, through forced abortion and other reasons, it had prevented 300 million lives from coming on this planet. Yeah. Now, the response to that here was what I would think it would be in most places, hopefully, around the United States, although I'm not sure anymore. That's the thing. A, a culture has, has reached the point in China where it is completely appropriate, not only appropriate, but they want to use it as a, a measure of what they have done in a constructive sense for the world to stop 300 million people from being born. Now, now we have had all kinds of resolutions introduced about China and about attacking their human rights record, which is of course deplorable, and, and condemning them and saying we, would, we should boycott the Olympics, certainly when, be, when they're going to Beijing this year, and we should draw attention to the civil rights and human rights violations in China, right? Good idea. I'm all for it. But you know, it's kind of hard, in a way, to stand up and be that moral leader in the world and draw attention to any other country's abuses when 50 million or more have died here in this country. Right? It is pretty hard to be this moral leader. And you know there's another issue about which I care greatly. It is the issue of illegal immigration. It's been an issue that I've been discussing for a long, long time. And it's no coincidence that there is a constant demand to keep the borders open, to bring in as many people as possible, to fill a lot of jobs 
that are going wanting, according to the people who are out there, right, saying that all this illegal, a, illegal alien well, uh, worker uh, uh, that's necessary, it's imperative that we have them. Why? Because we can't fill jobs? Why? Because there aren't enough Americans, there aren't enough people here in this country to do it? Why? Because 50 million have been killed? Do you think there's any potential connection there whatsoever? I do. I do. I think we are importing a servant class, essentially. We want to do this because as, as the ambassador from Greece, I was complaining to him in my office one day about the fact that Greece has now the lowest re reproduction rate in, in of any European country, 1.2, which of course is not replacement rate, and every country in Europe faces the same demographic disaster. Right? And abortion is a huge part of it. And I kept saying to him, how can this be? What are you doing? Don't you, aren't you worried about this? 1.2? And he finally said, yeah, I am. We are worried about it. He said, but, uh, and I said, well, what do you attribute this to? And he said, well, it's, it's the good life. It's the good life. Because people, of course, throughout Europe and other places have become accustomed to the idea that if they're going to have that extra car, extra television, or whatever else, it will be easy to sacrifice having a child. That's easy. I won't have the child, then I can have, quote, the good life. But this is a culture of death. That's what's meant by a culture of death. And that is, in fact, what's infecting us. And although we can talk about it, and there isn't a, a person on the stage today, any Republican that stands up or that's running for president today that doesn't say that they are against abortion now, and that, I mean, everybody, including Rudy, right, is talking about, well, I just made the mistake, or I'm not sure, but it's not right anymore. But, but everybody is, is a little negative on it, at least now, it's during the primaries, and so you're going to, everybody runs to the right. You know, I was elected in 1976 to the Colorado legislature when it was the first year I was ever able to cast a vote pro-life. And it's been 31 years that I have consistently been casting votes for a pro-life movement. But it is, not just, it is not just that. It is not just the laws that we can affect. It is, of course, imperative that we do so. I don't, for a moment, want to put down the effort to, to change the laws, of course we have to. And of course we have to appoint good judges. And of course we have to get Roe versus Wade overturned. Absolutely all those things are true. But I have to tell you, my friends, that if we do not change our hearts, we do not change the culture. And we will not change the effect. I mean, the, the, all the laws we can put on the books will have an effect. But it is really what's in, it is the heart of our culture that has to be changed. That's right. It is this culture of death we have to deal with. And somebody's got to talk about it in those words. Yes, in a religious sense. Because that's exactly what this boils down to. Right. All the laws you can pass in the won't matter if God does not approve of what's going on in your country. And there's only one way to get his approval, and that's to pray for it. And I do not mind saying it as a candidate. I do not mind saying it as the President of the United States. That it is God's blessing we need, and we have to pray for it. It is his protection that it, we, we, as a country, have to cry out for. Where's Jeremiah? Right? Here. Over here, yes. Over here. Jeremiah. The littlest Jeremiah. But remember what... Yeah, right there, Jeremiah. Mom and Dad, look on our campaign. And, uh, but now, do you remember... Do you remember what God said to Jeremiah? I knew you before you were in the womb. That's what God said. I knew you before you were in the womb. Jeremiah. He wasn't talking about a mass of cells. He was talking about a human being. He knew. And he knew you, and he knew you, and you, and he knew me before I was in the womb. It's, and, and we have to, I say, with all my heart, I believe, this country has to ask God for forgiveness for what has happened and pray that he changes the hearts of America as well as those of us who will do our best to change the laws of America. Thank you very much.